Welcome to the Center for International and Regional Studies at Georgetown University in Qatar. This podcast series is part of the Energy Humanities Research Initiative. The project aims to generate new scholarly conversations on everyday lived experiences of energy. Welcome to the Everyday Energy podcast series from Georgetown University in Qatar. This is the third episode in our themed cluster of podcasts on energy aesthetics representing lived experiences of oil. In the first two podcasts, we spoke with Venezuelan poet and scholar Santiago Acosta on abstract kinetic petro art and with Nigerian artist, photographer and writer, Victor Ehika Menor about his installation the wealth of nations. You can find all our previous activities on our webpage at cirs.qatar.georgetown.edu. I am Frat Oruch, and it gives me great pleasure to speak in this episode with Stacy Balkan, Associate Professor of Environmental Literature and Humanities at Florida Atlantic University on her recently published book, titled Rogues in the Post-Colony, Narrating Extraction and Itinerancy in India. Apparently, without taking any break, Stacy has already embarked on a new project titled Black Anthropocene Vistas, which investigates the racialized frontiers of extractive capitalism. Congratulations, Stacey, for your new book, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'll start with my first question. What does a close attention to extractivism, in particular to the broader terrain of extractivist violence across the global south, as you put it, tells us about lived experiences of energy, the latter defined as our everyday encounters with energy in and beyond the nation state. Okay, um, well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited. Um, and by the way, that was the, I, I just got tenure last week and hearing, a, that was the first time I heard associate in my life. So um, I didn't want to miss too. that opportunity. <laughs> that was exciting, To be the I know. first to congratulate. <laughs> thank you. Um, I know I, hearing that sounded exciting. Um, Okay, and thank you for um, this excellent question. I'm really excited to talk about uh, the new book. Um, okay, so what do I mean by this? Um, well, so I refer here um, to the previously limited or potentially limited and limiting scope of energy humanities work, which was often focused on sites of consumption in the global north, or alternatively with such notorious sites of extraction such as we see in the Niger Delta. So I wanted to kind of shift the lens, right? Um, As with the collection Oil Fictions, which we'll be discussing later, um, I wanted to expand this lens for several reasons. Um, First, turning the lens to what I call the broader terrain of extractivist violence across the global south, um, I believe enables a more expansive understanding of extractivism and I think affords a more robust engagement with its cultural and political expressions, whether whether methodologically or I guess how we read for energy, ontologically or how we understand and articulate such quote taxa as the human and putatively non-human beings that are reified and rendered as capital in order to serve global energy markets, right? Um, And finally, um, geographically as they do, uh, which is to say um, to consider the contrapuntal map of extractive capitalism that persistently, if invisibly, right? um, That's something we talk a lot about, right? Invisibility, um, if invisibly connects the global North and South in historically uneven and spectacularly violent ways, right? Um, Also, and like in keeping with energy humanities scholars who recognize the limitations of conventional critiques of extractivism that focus exclusively on the mining of fossil capital or the ever elusive quote oil encounter, right? Is something we talk about a lot. Um, In the book, I attempt to trace, I attempt to trace, sorry, a more capacious genealogy that attends to the broader energo political framework of extractive industries, such that we understand the harvesting of poppy, for example, as in the case of the Ibis trilogy, right? Um, as an instantiation of extractivist violence, insofar as the opium econ- economy participates in a similar colonial geologic um, to that of the colonial era coal economy, right? 
Um, and as extractivism, and I'll just, just to say something about this kind of logic, right? Um, as extractivism refers to both a practice and a political ideology, it seems essential to like sort of think about and outline the logic that subtends it, right? In order to understand how, for example, the rogue protagonists of something like Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy, trilogy sorry, um, concisely illustrate the aforementioned taxonomic model wherein they're kind of reducible to the raw nature of capital. Um, and of course, this is precisely how Naomi Klein famously defined extractivism, right? And this changes everything. Um, and this consideration of the framing logics of extractivism is also central to what we call, you know, a kind of resource logic, right? Um, which is to say that a perspective that understands the constituent elements of earth systems um, as an inventory of usable resources, right? And, and Amitav Ghosh's recent book, The Nutmeg's Curse, um, he also talks about this, he calls it a European metaphysics, which I thought was a, a great term. Um, so it refer to the sort of onto, the onto epistemological violence that indeed reduces earth systems as such. Um, and so this is a logic, of course, that's been central to colonial campaigns of dispossession for centuries, which continues to frame contemporary global regimes of extractive capital. Um, okay, so in terms of the, sorry, the everyday encounters with energy in and beyond the nation state, um, um, I would say the broadening of discussions around extractivism also allows for a more robust focus on extractive zones, which is to say like sites of production, right? Um, thereby also allowing for us to materialize what is often understood as the invisibility of extractivist violence. Um, because obviously extractivist violence is only invisible to the end consumer, right? Not to those persons whose lives are irrevocably altered by colonial campaigns that historically dispossessed their communities of their land and their resources. Um, and of course, I'm referring, I'm using uh, Macarena Gomez Barros's term, um, extractive zone, right? Um, what she uses to characterize regions where um, persons were historically um, kind of treated as fuel, um, essentially energy to be um, extracted, expended, and exhausted for the sake of, of prosperity elsewhere, right? Um, and I think, you know, there's surely been a lot of progress in terms of exposing these sites, right? And I really do attribute a lot of that to our work here in the energy humanities. Um, and um, so in which, you know, of course we make, we seek to make legible um, in the Anglo, in the Anglosphere that is, right? Like the material impacts of extractive capitalism. And of course, as an English professor, I do that with literature, hence, you know, hence a book about picaresque novels. Uh, my second uh, question was uh, exactly aiming to bring the discussion uh, to uh, your uh, literary uh, interest. And uh, one distinctive feature uh, of your book as you are uh, you know, uh, theorizing uh, uh, quite brilliantly on uh, the, uh, the whole concept of extractive zones and so on, you trace the impact of extractive capitalism through a particular novelistic genre. And uh, I, I have to say that I wasn't, uh, you know, it, it, when I first read the book, it seemed to be quite a unique uh, uh, genre choice. And that's the post-colonial, specifically the Anglophone Indian picaresque. Right? Uh, so could you uh, outline for us what energy humanities could learn from this specific narrative form and maybe in general, the value of attention to genre in thinking about uh, energy. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and first, I, I, I have to mention, and thank you, it's a wonderful question, and I, I, hope, I hope the book is, is brilliant. I was, so, I was so excited, and it's, it's so new. It's, it was a, you know, a very long labor of, of love that has recently appeared in, in the world, so thank you. Um, but um, I should mention, though, that, that the sort of study of the picaresque as such um, is not necessarily my own invention. Um, and so I, I wanted to first mention that I'm, I'm indebted to Rob Nixon, actually. Um, Rob Nixon's stunning critique of Indra Sinha's 2007 Animals People, um, which I discuss in the second chapter of the book as a memento mori to late capitalism. Um, but I was really inspired by his reading of the novel in his book and the um, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, the one that came out in 2011. Um, Nixon famously coined the term environmental picaresque, um, which really inspired me um, to characterize the novel, both because the narrator is a fairly typical Picaro figure, um, and more so because in the tradition of the picaresque genre, 
the nonlinear, which is to say the non-teleological format of the novel allows for the representation of what he called, or what he calls slow violence, right? Um, a form of environmental violence that like resists representation in conventional literary forms because it resists normative forms of closure, right? Um, Nixon terms it an attritional violence, um, which is to say that environmental violence is a protracted phenomenon whose causes and consequences can't be neat, like neatly bracketed um, in sort of such neat narrative frameworks as subtend something like the Buildings Roman or the autobiography, right? Um, but we might also consider that such forms of protracted violence transcend the teleological uh, temporality of capital more broadly. And that's something that I was obviously really interested um, in the book, right? Sort of also like a developmentalist temporality, which I talk about a lot. Um, interestingly, extractivism also works to subvert such neat forms of closure. Um, Jeff Insko recently described extraction in terms of a disruption to the standard teleology of capitalism's appropriation of resources. Um, similarly, in Liz Miller's new book, Extraction Ecologies, which is really wonderful, um, she describes a sort of extractive temporality, um, that, which is something I'm also going for, um, whereby the expansionist impulse of capitalism and the narrative forms with which industrial capitalism and of course carbon capitalism are coterminous is necessarily aborted by the finitude of subterranean resources, right? Um, so she traces a series of popular 19th century novels um, demonstrating how the perceived exhaustion of coal, for example, produces something like Wells's time machine, right? Um, but she also attends to Wells's contemporary, um, Bengali feminist writer Rokeya Hussein, whose critical utopian vision of a feminist solar powered utopia um, in 1905, the um, Sultana's Dream, can be read as a vital means of imagining alternatives um, to both fossil fuel modernity as well as its violent social conditions. Um, anyway, so the picaresque novel to a great extent also forecloses the neat narrative resolutions of the modern novel insofar as it is as a rule told in a series of vignettes, right? Um, generally speaking, the vignettes or episodes feature an itinerant and unreliable narrator um, who inhabits such mundane plots as we glimpse in like the 1554 Lasadio de Torme, if are you familiar with? Okay, great. Um, so, you know, in the novel, the famed Picaro, right, he's describing the drudgery of acquiring his daily bread, right? Um, and as we know, survival then and now was never really seen as worthy of, of literary attention, right? <laughs> so, um, hence, critic Giancarlo Maiorino, who I really, whose work I really like, um, discusses the genre in terms of its productive econo-poetics, which is to say a narrative mode that centralizes the proletarian desires of the working class subject. Um, significantly, such a sort of seemingly pointless journey, right? Lacking no traditional hero and with no grand resolution surely doesn't satisfy the criteria of the modern novel um, in the really problematic terms of somebody like John Updike, who we may recall, right? Famously derided um, Cities of Salt, right? Um, he said it was an insufficiently westernized novel. I'm trying to remember this, right? You know, um, because That's in true. his, yeah, he, you know, it was this horrible review, which of course inspired Gauche's famous essay, um, Petrofiction, right? But, you know, he said in his estimation, he says that a novel ought to be a story of individual moral adventure and one that features a conventional hero, right? Um, so surely not the sorts of rogues and outcasts that are, um, you know, persistently criminalized and then become the protagonists in the novels that I'm studying, right? So then um, sort of departing from that and following like Lisa Lowe's argument, um, in the mid 90s, an immigrant actually talks about the ethnic buildings, Roman, um, and Joseph Slaughter, um, who also talks about sort of problematic teleology of capitalist enfranchisement that's imminent to the buildings, Roman, more broadly. Um, I was curious to explore stories where there was no sort of, you know, ultimate resolution, which sort of, you know, which was um, representative of what they both call like the incorporation of um, the hero into, you know, into an elite class. I was interested in stories that explicitly rejected what I essentially see as a colonialist bildung, right? Um, and I'll just say one more thing in terms of the form specific affordances for the energy humanities or for reading energy, we might say that the non teleological format, which resists closure, right? Um, and indeed balks at the possibility of any sort of neat narrative closure owing to the material impossibility of such tales, that it precisely instantiates this, what I said earlier was a kind of extractive temporality, um, that is resolution or, or sort of norm, the normative reproductive futurity imminent to something like the marriage plot to return to Miller is necessarily aborted, 
Um, I could all, I guess, you know, we could also think in terms of like the boom and bust cycle. Um, so in the context of like the boom and bust extractive capital, I see these satirical novels um, as means of like focusing on the bust and making clear the impossibility of the boom, right? Does that make, does that make sense? Um, anyway, this is, I mean, this is definitely how I read something like Aravinda Diga's coal-soaked um, picaresque novel, The White Tiger, um, which, you know, lots of people rightfully also read, including Swarlipi, um, as a neoliberal buildings roman, um, but I actually read it as a carbon picaresque, um, but we can talk about that. So I don't want to say too much. I think I hope I answered your question. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, in a way, I, I imagine the uh, picaresque character, anti-hero, uh, with some uh, sort of agency that messes up with the temporality and sites of uh, extractivism, right? The, uh, sure. In terms of, you know, sometimes too slow, sometimes too fast in their in uh, his or her movements and navigating uh, the various spaces and and, and so on sure. right well this is the sort of itinerant nature which um, yes the itinerant you know, nature yeah, absolutely yeah. Um, which directly subverts this kind of you know like Lockean mandate of capital uh -huh. right? like um, and subverts I think Dominic Boyer and um, in Anergo Sorry, Anergo Politics, Wind and Power of the Anthropocene, which I really appreciated. Um, he talked about you know, the logic of land as property, which we talk about a lot. And in many ways, this rogue figure subverts that. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, I think my next question is, oh. uh, is a follow-up to, to that. So uh, from the series of webinars and podcast clusters theme around, uh, themed around uh, our research initiative uh, here at Georgetown Qatar, there emerged a set of questions and considerations regarding the affective dimensions of energy, not just its social, political, and material aspects. So uh, what kind of affective intensities, if you will, can one find in what you uh, call rogue tales? Can we talk about rogue affects? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. And I, you know, ultimately something that I've been thinking about more lately. Um, so thank you. Um, I guess sort of like thinking about affect in this context, I often think about um, Stephanie Lemenoget's work um, and specifically the idea of the petromelancholic. Um, do you remember that in, in Living Oil, right? Um, which is yes. like a stunning character, right? Yeah, okay. So um, this sort of like stunning characterization of our affective attachments to oil specifically. Um, and it seems that the dystopian tendencies of popular energy narratives, right, which we see everywhere, um, particularly in film and television, a lot of the stuff, I'm teaching a class in climate fiction right now, which is, you know, all dystopian hellscapes, right? Um, but it seems that this, you know, is sort of, uh, you know, demonstrates an inability or an unwillingness to articulate a world after oil, right? Um, because we can't bear such a thing. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, if we understand such attachments less in terms of a particular form of energy, right? Like a material discrete thing that only attains value as we're talking about before um, when marshaled into a system of, of capital. If we instead think of that as an aspect of attachment to a particular set of freedoms that we associate with industrial modernity, for example, or carbon modernity, I guess we might understand as you were just saying, right? The itinerant nature of the rogue figure as in many ways as like the inverse of such freedoms, if that makes sense, right? So, I mean, I talk about this a lot in the book, but, and sort of thinking about the rogue figure in terms of a kind of praxis. So like Mike Davis talks um, about like um, these, you know, sort of displaced figures, often internally displaced figures in terms of, he says, wealth's negative counterpart. Um, and I, I mean, I, and whose work, I, of course, I, I really, really ad admire, um, but I, I do try to read, you know, I try to read a sort of Planet of the Commons instead of Planet of the Slum. So that, that's an aside, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, so, but yeah, I, I think a lot about praxis in the book and the ways in which the kind of rogue is like this monstrous other, right? Like whose who sacrifice is, is a necessary condition for prosperity elsewhere. And of course, you know, pace scholars like Sylvia Winter, you know, I'm thinking in terms of a kind of transversality in that sense, which is to say like the production of the citizen subject 
by virtue of the ruination of disposable labor, right? Those persons who indeed can't enjoy this like colonialist building or developmentalist building um, because they're excluded from this narrative, but also because they constitute the material possibility of, of that narrative, right? Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so I guess, you know, and just to say maybe a, a couple of things about the rogue figure before like returning to your question, just because I think for our audience, I don't know how much folks have been thinking about this. Um, but so the rogue figure has been defined, you know, by several folks in, in such ways, sort of thinking in terms of, of this kind of praxis. Um, so for example, back to Nixon, who um, kind of talks about the displaced commoner as a kind of rogue figure. He says, he describes the commons dependent wandering pastoralist who can be dismissed as an unanchored rogue anachronism and someone who in Lockean terms refuses to take root in a private property regime of pur purported individual and thereby collective self-improvement. Um, Peter Leinbaugh and Marcus Redeker in um, that Many-Headed Hydra, remember that book, right? Um, they make a similar case and they, they talk about the rogue figure as a kind of unsteady, they call it say an unsteady proletariat, essentially, you know, produced by the shifting agrarian economy. Um, and in a literary context, um, I often think about Martinetian novelist Patrick Tamazou's novel Texaco as a kind of post-colonial picaresque, right? Um, mm. And he talks about a, a proletariat without factories and without work, right? So all these different um, instantiations of displacement, right? But okay, so back to rogue ethics, uh, <laughs> readings that um, might understand this wandering figure otherwise. Um, this is also a really difficult question because I think, you know, I. The consensus is that this displaced figure, right, serves a particular material end and that these novels are necessarily um, kind of shrouded in, in suffering, right? Um, which to a great extent they are, you know? Um, and, you know, while I want to assert a sort of rogue freedom, right? Like imminent to the itinerant character of the Picaro, as you were saying earlier too, right? I also don't want to romanticize the material reality of of forced displacement that caused, right, in the case of British occupied Bengal, mm -hmm. for example, an unprecedented internal diaspora, which is also marked by new forms of indenture. Um, you know, and similarly, and this might be a criticism of Indra Sinha's titular Picaro and Animals People, the rogue freedoms that we might associate with animal can't be disconnected from the material hardships of his journey, right? And so, as I state, you know, perhaps too often in the book, um, the trope of adventure and wandering, which is often kind of the central consideration and more conservative considerations of the picaresque genre. Um, a famous example is Robert Alter's book from 1965, The Rogue's Progress, sort of this like celebration of, of, of sort of the trope of adventure. Um, well, um, which in the post-colonial context, of course, is a kind of forced itinerancy. So anyway, so while I, I guess I like to think about these, you know, kind of rogue freedoms that we can associate with the post colonial picaresque novel, whereby a figure like Gosha's Picara Diti or Animal or Adiga's Picaro Balram kind of subvert, as we said before, these sort of Lockean mandates of modernity, right? Um, they're also criminalized and, and, and brutalized as a consequence of their resistance um, to this sort of logic of land as property. Um, um, anyway, okay, I'm probably talking too much. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time. Um, but I was going to say, though, too, you know, it's not to say that the rogue tales are reducible to stories of suffering nor that satire can't be very productive. And of course, there's much joy in the novels that I consider perhaps particularly um, an animal's people. Um, but what we might understand as a kind of picaresque sensibility um, is indeed, you know, certainly framed by, by material suffering, right? And this is why I turn to the speculative in, in the conclusion to the book, um, which I begin with an epigraph from Gomez Badas's Extractive Zone. And if I can just quote her, because I really, I kind of love the sentiment um, of, of this. She says, if we only track the purview of power's destruction and death force, we are forever analytically imprisoned to reproducing a totalizing viewpoint that ignores life, that is unbridled and finds forms of resisting and living alternatively. Um, which is to say, right, we already understand the problem, right? <laughs> um, and we need to sort of, you know, at least attempt to engage with more productive envisionings of the future. Um, the after all collective refers to this as a kind of ut usefully utopian thinking. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, you know, contra sort of images in these popular cli-fi productions like Paolo Gucci, Bacigalupi's Shipbreaker, which I'm actually teaching right now. Um, you know, I don't want to, I, I certainly don't want to believe that the only alternative to extractive capitalism is 
you know, these sort of the story of dystopian hellscapes in which we're cannibalizing each other or something, right? <laughs> um, so following some really exciting work in our field, particularly the After Oil Collective, um, in the conclusion, I try to envision a kind of post-oil or post-extractivist future that, that doesn't, you know, um, nearly sort of resort the dystopian um, nor mourn um, in this, you know, a la this kind of petro-melancholic affect sort of, you know, mourn that, you know, uh, extractive past, if you will. Um, I feel like I'm talking too much. I'll stop there. <laughs> so, no, that's really yeah. fascinating. And that, I think definitely, uh, uh, you know, a, an attention to the uh, rogue affects enable us to, as you put it, to envision a new affective horizons beyond melancholia. My final question uh, has to do uh, with the very concept of the speculative as a mode of reading as you uh, propose in, in your book. And I, I took this, you know, uh, uh, quite uh, to be quite an interesting uh, method uh, in terms of uh, reading uh, energy or reading for, for energy, right? And uh, so you describe uh, speculative critical reading praxis as one that centralizes energy and energy regimes for attending to cultural productions uh, like postcolonial rogue fictions. Uh, I think my question is, uh, what does speculative methodology reveal, so to speak, about our collective energy unconscious? Okay, this is a, a great question and kind of, you know, um, very central to this book and also to Swarlipi and my collection as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, you know, the, the speculative methodology. So this is something I try to do explicitly in the final chapter in The White Tiger um, in order to read the otherwise elusive presence of coal, for example. Um, and also in the conclusion to project, you know, the aforementioned post oil future, right? Whereby we aren't necessarily like cannibalizing each other or something, or <laughs> it doesn't look like shipbreaker. Um, but this is also part of a broader methodological approach born of the desire to make energy legible, right? So my initial desire was to transcend what critics like Mazeman describe as the analytical prison house of kind of conventional literary studies, whereby we understand energy forms like coal or petrol and so forth, right? In terms of what it refers to as, quote, mere backdrop, um, and to instead understand the ways in which energy forms seep into every aspect of our lived experiences, right? So like how the period of petromodernity as, you know, Debesh Chakrabarti famously described, right, is how it is literally saturated in fossil fuels, right? Um, so, and in, in this sense, of course, we can say, and, you know, a lot of um, the, the critics in our collection say this as well, right, that there's no cultural production in the era of industrial modernity that is not also a petrocultural production. Right, so we need to read differently, essentially. Um, although I should also say, and in, in keeping with like Kara Doggett's recent history of, of energy too, um, while I use the term petrocultural, I don't only mean petroleum, but the long history of carbon capitalism in which the recent proliferation of petroleum, right, is, is just one chapter. Um, and a chapter that, that indeed reproduces, as I was discussing earlier, right, the same phenomena of displacement and dispossession that we can associate with earlier forms of carbon capitalism. Um, which is to say also that, well, Tim Mitchell, who's, you know, wonderful book, um, Carbon Democracy, right? You know, well, he cites the coal powered factory, for example, as in part a site of, of organizing and solidarity, right? And rightfully so, you know, the coal economy, you know, bears a lot of similarity <laughs> to the petroleum economy, um, you know, which was, you know, coal was also marked by, is marked by egregious labor conditions, including at India's longest operating coal mine in Ranaganj, which I talk about in the final chapter, um, which of course opened during the reign of the East India Company. Um, um, so anyway, you know, given that centuries of cultural production have been framed by extractive capitalism and that the fruits of modern extractivist economies are harvested in a global network whereby sites of production are persistently veiled um, so that energy appears as like some sort of magical force that we may harness and, and enjoy and you know, I hate to say this, but in the sort of grotesque landscapes of overconsumption and hyperdevelopment, um, places, you know, that I you know, that we inhabit, many of us. Um, I try to follow such critics as Eamon, Graham McDonald, um, Swear Leapy, um, you know, and demanding that our critical practices account for that which seeps beyond the frame, if you will. 
So to read energy with a speculative critical eye, as I do in the final chapter on the white tiger, is to understand, per Adiga's Picaro Ballroom, um, that we are quite literally baptized in fossilized carbon from the moment of our inauspicious births. Um, but also to your point about a speculative critical methodology in terms of attending to our collective energy unconscious, um, or the underlying structure of feeling that subtends petromodernity. And of course, I, I take the term energy unconscious from Patricia Yeager, right? I, I find that such speculative reading practices are essential to making legible the otherwise invisible presence of that which enabled literally and directly such otherwise abstract phenomena as, as maybe we can think of examples like the sublime forms of motion that a poet like William Wordsworth is, is celebrating an homage to steam, or maybe somebody is, you know, near and dear to my heart as a child from New Jersey, you know, Bruce Springsteen's famous admonishment of, of you know, the fuel injected American dream in, in Born to Run, right? Um, so I think this, you know, sort of speculative critique is essential. Um, and just one more thing I was going to say, you know, as I also argue in the context of the white tiger, such a speculative mode of reading also attends to what Peter Hitchcock famously referred to as the kind of imaginative challenges um, that are, you know, that, that that he talks about in terms of the imaginative challenges presented by the constitutive limits, um, which is to say the structural absence, right, of of oil, right. So it's sort of it, this kind of speculative critique allows for us to attend to that which isn't kind of um, necessarily legible or, or palpable. Um, for Hitchcock, and I'll quote him here, he says, you know, to think energy is always to address constitutive limits. And the point in foregrounding such discussions within the humanities is not to forget about limits, but is rather to focus on the imaginative challenges that they represent. Um, so I think in employing a speculative praxis, we can posit the limit as a kind of point of departure, right, instead of um, an, an impasse, right? Um, and just and say one more thing, and I'll stop so we can chat more. But um, but you know, instead of thinking about an impasse, or also what in the the first petroculture, or the first sorry, the first after oil publication, um, they talk about sort of thinking about um, this um, otherwise impasse as a moment of radical indeterminacy. And I really like that idea. So I think you know this sort of speculative critical eye, you know, allows for us to of course you know, acknowledge as, as I do, you know, thinking about these rogue tales, right, the sort of material hardships um, to, to not sort of deny, right, um, the, you know, what's operating in the extractive zone, but, but also to sort of perhaps see this as, as a point of departure for thinking beyond um, that. And I guess I, I should probably stop there so we have <laughs> some time to chat more. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, as you might re recall, Frederick Jameson's own Political Unconscious, uh, the yeah. sort of founding text yeah. for speculative critical reading, if you will, yes. uh, starts with always historicized. And yes. I think for us energy humani uh, humanists, it should be always energized, the, the dictum. Oh, yes. Us, yes. Right? yes. I love that, yeah. <laughs> always energized. Yes. But thank you so much for this really insightful conversation. And it definitely gives us a lot to think about further about the thorny question of energy forms and representation. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. And I and thank you for giving me so much to think about. Because like I said, I feel like I, I I need, you know, there are areas that I want to explore much more, particularly in terms of these sorts of rogue ethics. So yeah, thank you for wonderful questions.